Foundation, hosted by Power to Practice, the first and only EMR designed specifically for integrative, anti-aging, and functional medicine practices. Before we begin the webinar, I would like to run through just a couple of housekeeping items. The slideshow and lecture portion of the webinar will last approximately 30 to 45 minutes, and we'll plan to save about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. If you do have a question, feel free to type it in the chat box. My name is Linda, and I will funnel all questions to Dr. Savage during the Q&A portion. If you do think of a question later after the webinar is completed, please email them to sales at powertopractice.com for response from Dr. Savage and team. We will also have that email address on the last slide of the presentation. Dr. Savage will do his best to answer each question during the Q&A portion, yet keep an eye out for a follow-up blog, which will arrive through our newsletter later on this week. We will post a recording along with all of the questions and answers from our webinar today. To type a question into the chat, use the GoToWebinar control panel and locate the bar labeled questions. Feel free to try that out now. In addition, we have made a PDF version of the webinar slides available for download from right here in the webinar. To download that PDF, locate the bar labeled handouts on that GoToWebinar control panel. Click there and um, you can just double click and it should start to download. Of course, we do have all audio set to mute with exception of our presenter, Dr. Paul Savage. Dr. Savage founded Power to Practice in 2011. He currently serves as the chairman of the board as well as the chief medical officer. He graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School in emergency medicine and later earned his board certification in integrative medicine at George Washington University. He is currently enrolled in the Fellowship for Stem Cell Therapy through A4M and the University of South Florida. Since 2004, he has practiced integrative medicine exclusively and is considered by many as one of the world's foremost authorities in the area of integrative metabolic medicine, including bioidentical hormone therapy. Dr. Savage is the president of Chicago Integrative Care, his practice in Chicago, and he continues to lecture worldwide and frequently provides expert insights on integrative medicine to major news media. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Dr. Paul Savage. So let's get started. Thanks, Linda, and uh, welcome to all the attendees to this lecture. Whether we like it or not, and I've been a doctor now for 28 years, having graduated in 1988 and been in innovative medicine since the late 90s, uh, eventually technology had to catch up to us. Uh, we were one of the healthcare was for a very long time and probably could be arguably still one of the fields of, of industries which has been horribly behind in the world of technology. Now, with the advent of EMRs and the increasing adoption of EMRs within the um, medical space, we're seeing more and more doctors interact both positively and negatively with, uh, with technology. One of the largest changes we've seen in the healthcare sector and with very large potentials to become a significant player has been in the area of wearable health trackers. Now we're going to spend this presentation, we're going to go over essentially what we're talking about when we say talk about wearables because there's a lot of different areas and this is a very broad topic so hopefully we're just going to focus in and zoom into what, what is driving this market and what's really driving this market currently is patients desire to get healthy. So the wearables is a revolution through technology and it's amazing on how many clients are becoming more and more adept at monitoring their health on a daily fashion. Um, we, we will go through some statistics later but it, it ranges from the elderly to the, to the young. We see kids as young as seven and eight now starting to track their steps with their wearable cell phones. But there's no denying that technology is going to be a part of our world and becoming comfortable with it and learning how to use it to the best of our ability is paramount as physicians. Does it save lives? Well, interestingly, we're seeing more and more of these stories start appearing into the literature as well as into the media, which was recently uh, submitted, oops, sorry, was recently submitted was a story about a man in, in New Jersey 
in Camden who was 42 and had a seizure outside the hospital, never having known to have seizures before. And the, and the EMS showed up on the scene and appropriately gave him some deltiazam to slow down his heart, heart rate. Um, and then when they got to the hospital, his heart rate was better controlled. But the question was obviously, was this new onset atrial fib, which is what's showing on the monitor, or was this chronic? Because as an old ER doctor, which I am, that was a big question of, in this case, that the guy had a seizure at 42, never having known to have seizures or atrial fib before, it would be a good guess that this would be atrial, a new onset atrial fib and require cardioversion, but it wouldn't be certain. So the interesting thing that this emergency nurse actually looked at is wearable foam data, and you can see that uh, on the upper right hand part of the screen, and the area right around 6 a.m. in the morning is when he had his, uh, sorry, right around noon is when he had a seizure. And previous to that, he hadn't had a net heart rate over 109, and it sustained over 150 until the, the, until the paramedics showed up and gave him his parapamil. So by the time he got to the emergency room, he was back down into an atrial fib, but at a controlled rate. So based upon that critical piece of information, the doctor appropriately cardioverted this man without waiting any further. Uh, to alleviate the arrhythmia. So it's interesting that we're going to start seeing more and more of these reports. It's not just going to be on the heart rate or the beats per minute, but we're going to start seeing things as it shows up eventually we'll get into brain waves and uh, saturations and all these different things that we can actually start diagnosing things based upon the onset and the determination of the different variables. So. Are wearables a new thing and are they bad or are they going to become part of our network of, of increasing tool? Well, in 2015, we saw a significant, there was a significant increase. And remember, wearables have only been around since 2002, 2003, when we defined wearables as the wrist wearables that started to show up uh, in the Fitbit area, in the, the Nike. So by within a matter of a decade, we have about 40 million people using wearable devices. And that's an increase of over doubling over the year before. It's predicted within the next three years, it's going to double again. And by 2019, almost two out of five of internet users will be using wearables. So this is a significant change in the patient population. And this goes across all ages. We're starting to see data collected and being able to obtain in our office. I know in my office visit, until recent uh, adaptions in the software system has the ability to actually for me to see all their online data because we're integrated with Fitbit. But I was looking at people's cell phone, uh, their iPhone apps to see what was their physical activity on a daily fashion over a course of a month. How many hours of sleep? And what did that sleep look like? It was very interesting for me because as an integrated medicine doctor, we're always telling people to get more exercise and sleep more and want to know how their sleep or how interrupted their sleep is because we understand the impact of the sleep and the exercise has on their overall health as well as being able to see what they're eating. And now the technology is doing this for patients automatically. So I can actually have people in, especially on first visit, let me see your iPhone and you go back and look at your sleep functions or it's integrated with the software and I can actually see how many hours they're sleeping and what the frequency of their wake cycles are to determine, confirm for me, symptomatically it sounds like you have sleep apnea. Physically it looks like you should have sleep apnea. And lo and behold, I have an iPhone here that's now pretty significant in showing me their sleep data. So this has impacted us in the world of medicine and I think I can speak to most of the listeners out there in the fact of utilizing this on a on a each appointment basis. So whether people are monitoring their weight or their stress levels because now there's apps like Pacifica which people are saying what their mood is every day or the uh, Fitbit to measure their heart rate or what their water intake is or even able to have some wearable devices which are now doing blood pressure monitoring at home every hour because the home blood pressure monitoring is much more closely related to the necessity of treatment. So we're going to, there's a lot of devices out there. There's ones that are worn on the head, and there's ones that are worn around the chest, and there's now embedded into, into shirts and dresses and underwear and socks. There's the 
ones that are worn on the wrist, and there's one that clip onto your belt, and there's ones that go inside your shoes. The runners have a whole plethora of technology that show us different things, and they can either report to an app, and then there's all these other apps out there that you can download from the iStore, which is like what your mood doing, and, uh, and Zen music uh, that pops up every 30 minutes or 60 minutes to kind of calm your mood down. So it's a wonderful area of technology out there that's very interesting on how it's impacting patients. But the question still exists as, is it making an impact? And how, as physicians, do we tap into this data and use it more effectively for our clients? So who is the wearable user? Well, it's about 50-50 female and male, but the typical bullseye patient is a 30-year-old marketing female who makes about $100,000 per year around that area. But we see a really diverse range. We see even people that are over 55 starting to adopt this more. Uh, we see people as young as uh, 18. Certain, that number has gone up dramatically even within the past few months. And, and although typically it tends to be in the people who you know, make um, about 100,000 or less, not more, that are using it even more often. The, the number on the income is a little spewed because obviously people make over 150,000 or 1% or and those people are 4% of them are making it, so they are not as big as the population as the 35 percenters, which are between 50 and 99, which is a, a lost majority of the U.S. population. So that number is huge. Today, if you've noticed in your practice, people are different than they were even five years ago. They are looking on the internet for their symptoms, and they're checking WebMD, and they're checking with the CDC, and they're diagnosing themselves via the internet, Dr. Google, before they even show up in your office. For the right or for the wrong reasons, that's how they're doing it. And the majority of people are looking online for symptoms, what does it mean, and how to treat it, and then they're looking to find out who can treat it the best in their area. And they're looking, they're looking at you. They're looking at you on your website. They're looking at you on your LinkedIn. They're looking at you on um, the Illinois or the Department of Public Regulations. They're looking at you and researching you a lot before they see you if they haven't been referred to their friend. And patients are more likely to get a referral from the internet now than they are from their friends. So that process has changed because they're already figuring out what's wrong with them or they have a good idea what they think is wrong with them and they're already finding out who's the best person based upon Craigslist and, uh, and uh, uh, Angie's list before and all those other modalities out there. So these people are coming into your office already aware of what they want from their doctors. And during their visit, they're, they're research, so you tell them how you think you're going to treat them and uh, they're, you know, they're willing to pay for um, their supplements and they're willing to spend more and to get away from the medicine, but then they're going to go out and they're going to figure out what you told them and they're going to determine whether what you told them was right. So that's another thing, they're cross-checking your diagnosis and your therapy plan via the internet. So they're engaging more in their own care, which is great because we know the research is out there that people who are more engaged in their health care get better quicker and stay better longer, which is obviously our goal in integrated medicine. So it's very important that, that we notice there that not only are they researching us before and after, but they're also now keeping score of how they're getting, how they're progressing better. And it's not just the objective data of their heart rate and their blood pressure. They're also doing their scores on their mood and their energy because there's, a, like I told you, Pacifica is one of those apps that people can actually determine how am I feeling today. So that becomes an objective marker as well. The activity markers, now wearable devices, we call them fitness activity trackers or FATs, kind of a funny pseudonym for it, but they're fitness activity trackers. So that can be all sorts of different things. But what in this case, I'm talking about mostly the wearable devices that are fitness trackers. So that would be a, um, a Fitbit, a Nike, a Jawbone, a, a Pebble. Uh, there's a number of these different applications out there. We'll go through those a little bit faster or a little bit, little bit in a little bit. But 11% of adults use a fitness tracker, so one out of 10, and that number is increasing. It should be two out of, it should be four out of 10 of quadruple in the next four years. About the same number are using smartphone applications as their pedometer or their other apps. And then 14% of them plan to start using a device in the next year. So it's interesting that when you all total it up together, although 60% currently by this technology advice survey, which was done in 2013 or 2014, 
um, don't use an app. That number's already changed. And in this year, in the Mekoski study, 79% of consumers would consider using activity trackers, which was up from 14% just two years before. Here's an interesting statistic that if provided by the physician a free tracking device, their willing to, willingness to go up to it jumped from 11 to 48% immediately. And that's kind of an interesting play because a lot in our office what we do now is we include the tracking device as part of our initial visit. That cost is embedded in our initial visit. And we're giving people our fitness trackers and we use Fitbit because it integrates with my software, the software that we utilize. So we're giving that as part of the initial visit so that we can track their sleep, we can track their activity over time. The willingness is, is interesting that although the older population is the one that is the most unwilling to use a fitness tractor, they're the one that is changing the quickest. So when you look at the studies over time, that number, this is a 2013, it's now down to 40% of the 65 years and older. So they're actually adapting faster than the other previous years. But it is interesting that age does relate because 30, 40, 50 year olds, they're all about 50%. Above the, the 60s, the 70s, they're a little bit more resistant. A little bit of that change can't be accounted for by them dying off because it's only been two years since these percentages have changed so greatly. Because this technology advice survey here was done in 2014. So Fitbit did a recent survey about a year ago and they in interviewed their users and their users believe that Fitbit keeps them aware of their activity level and it's a competitive in incentivizing agent. We all know as doctors that you want to make, you want to gamify everything. You want to make everything a game for the patient. It induces the serotonin and the dopamine. It gives them a reward sense when they make their goals. Yay. Well, this is a great game to play by setting it at 10,000 steps per day, which is the industry standard set, of, set for by the American Heart Association. And I don't agree with that. I think the number is much higher than that, depending on the medical condition. At least we're looking at a research. And we can go we'll present in a future presentation on how our Fitbit data that we're looking at in the cardiovascular patients needs to be significantly higher than that. And, and, but in the short term, what we're knowing here is the, the patients or the users of Fitbit believe and that's huge. They believe that Fitbit keeps them more active. They believe it motivates them to walk further every day. They believe that it's useful in personal health. And they believe that it, they claim it takes more steps now than before they started using their Fitbit tracker. And that's, if you look at the patients I've watched through my office, when we give them the Fitbit within the first two months, it's amazing on how they, on average, go up by 50% in the number of steps they do per day just because of they're aware of their sedentary behavior. And we all know that, that sitting is the new smoking. Wait, there are some surveys out, although they're not as many as I'd like to see. There's only a couple hundred out there. But, that some, but they're all kind of leaning towards the same way that people who use these trackers, it does have an effect on them. Matter of fact, the ARIA users, which is Fitbit's scale, user in the first six months, 70%, 76% of them say they lost weight. And they average lose about three pounds the first month without doing anything other than tracking their results. This was just track your results and let's see where you go. And the average person lost three pounds in the first month. Um, the area also uh, doubled their weight loss if they used the Fitbit in combination with using the scale. So there's another study that was published by Kaiser, Perman, uh, Kaiser Permanente, which is these huge studies, and this was 1,700 participants that were that if the patient kept a food log, a food diary, whether that was on their Fitbit app, which they have a great diary, that 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 became a predictor of weight loss, and they doubled their weight loss if they kept the diary. So can you imagine having it on the ARIA? I'd love to see the study with the ARIA and the Fitbit and a log which is all able to be done through the fitness application and visible through the EMR. So the mobile apps boost weight loss by an average of 15 pounds in the first year. So that was done by the University of Chicago. And just simply having the app on your phone was a requirement to participate in the study. And they noticed that the people who had this app on their phone lost 15 pounds because they tracked what they ate. 
It's all about conscious thinking, conscious living, mindfulness. So we started looking at the older population, and ARP did a great study where they they looked at the fitness tracker in Americans over 50. And what did they find? 67% of them, that's very close to that upper percentage of that 75%, found it to be beneficial and that they found that they slept better and did more activity when they measured their biometric data, such as their heart rate, in addition as to the blood sugar. So here's an interesting thing is not only olders get better, but the sicker you are, the better you're going to do with the mobile device. This study was done by the Meskowski group. We just showed that 83% of mental health people got better, 679% of gastrointestinal health uh, problems got better, obesity got better, pulmonary conditions and vascular conditions all got better. They, it, when they were diagnosed with an illness, they were more likely to use a mobile device and to improve in their health. Are they accurate? Well, there's not a lot of studies out there on accuracy. There's some out there on the weight and the heart rate, but this is one that has to do with the heart rates and the staff, which is two of the more common technologies that we utilize in my office every day. And the, obje and the, and the question is, how accurate does that compare? So basically, the scientists took a bunch of people, and they put Fitbits and Jawbones and Pebbles and all of this, and they had them walk what they and why somebody counted their steps manually. And they compared to the, the results. So the results was that half the fitness tractors underestimated the energy expenditure and the rest overestimated it, but they were close. They weren't without accuracy. They actually, um, what we saw here, the steps here, this is the people in the middle column who were supposed to walk 500 steps. And they walked somewhere between 400 and 600. And these are the ones that walked 1,000. And they walked somewhere between on the low end 800 and the high end 1400. So although it, did, it wasn't completely accurate, they were in the ballparks and they'd lower the number the, the closer to the rain on the, on, the, on the access. Also with the heart rates, the same thing is they manually, man, manually measured them and did it by the trackers. And on average, they did pretty well, although the variability could be anywhere between you know, um, 20% but they were reproducible within that 20%. So it's very, the, the important thing to understand and the conclusion of this is that their conclusion, I'm not sure I agree completely with what they wrote, but it's currently quite challenging to tell which fitness tractors are accurate or reliable, but since they are not, which they are not since they aren't much that available. But these studies continue to demonstrate that even the most popular application and devices may be inaccurate with some variability, but they do track. They do track. So are wearables a natural fit for us as integrative anti-aging and functional medicine practices? The answer is yes. They're perfect for us because our patients seek care outside the traditional conventional medicine in which we implement lifestyle changes, most notably what, how, how much activity you're getting per day, how much um, sleep are you getting per night, and what's that sleep looking like what are you eating during the course of the day, how much and what. And these trackers are able to give us as physicians fairly reliable and reproducible data on a, a patient. It, it's trendable. That's the important part I always tell patients is they can come to our office and we can give them exactly through a GE Lunar Prodigy Advance what their, bone, what their body composition is and they can go home on their, their $99 uh, body fat machine at home and there may be a couple percentage off so they're not accurate but they can be trending because as their body fat at home goes down their body fat in the office will go down so these wearables are perfect for us in, in trending ability looking over time it motivates the patient it helps them get organized and it's technology savvy as compared to people patients working with an insurance bottle because the doctor's insurance bottle see them for 15 minutes on average and they don't have time to review all the lifestyle stuff with them that are, as we know, highly beneficial. Using wearables to improve patient outcomes, it's all about the data, right? We want the data because we want to track trends so that we can tell our clients how, what they need to do more because you see a client, they come in, you know they're exercising or getting some mobility, but you know they're not losing weight fast enough. And one of the things you may want to do is increase their mobility. You want to see that number go upwards, which will know with the trend that they do, so that we can see in the next visit how much they're more improving. 
We want to be able to improve our office visit by having that data accessible to us immediately. So I don't have to go, now we don't have to go give me your cell phone and log on and let's go to your app. Now I can do it through the software itself. So immediately I can see how their sleep's improving or not or getting worse and I can see what their heart rate's doing. I can see what their steps are doing, how much is improving. So we can educate them on the areas that need to be educated because now we have actually objective data instead of just asking a patient, how do you sleep? It's interesting when you ask someone how many steps a day they take and you tell them how many miles, how many steps are in a mile, people, underestim or people overestimate it by almost double the amount. So when people actually think they are getting 8,000 steps a day, they're probably only getting four. And that's one of the things that really kind of shock people, like, wow, I really need to go get more. Same thing with sleep. Oh, no, I'm sleeping eight hours a night. And then you do the sleep data, uh, Fitbit, and you're finding out they're really only sleeping six or maybe six and a half. And that really brings home to the point more accurately to help them change behaviors. And it's a greater value because patients want actionable insights. They don't want to know something unless you can tell them what to do about it. They want to know, oh, so this is why, because that makes it more believable. How many times have you had a patient that you tell them you need to get more activity and they're like, I'm getting plenty. And then you go, no, you're not. Because now you have the objective data to help back up your assertion that you want them to do more, and then you can have an open discussion on how much more, sleep more, and you can correlate the sleep value because their inflammatory markers are going up or their, their cortisol levels are not improving or whatever value you're looking at. But now you can say, not, your sleep's not better, it's actually worse, and then it's not surprising that these other laboratory and physiologic findings change as well. So it's using it as a network group of numbers to Im impress your patient. Patients seek rapid health developments. Wearables inspire motivation. The, that's clear. People who wear wearable devices do more. Is it impacting their health? We don't know that yet. There's not enough studies out there. They're, they're coming, but we don't know how many steps a day for cardiovascular health, how, many, um, how, many, how much water per day for GI issues, how much, um, how much heart rate uh, for people to, to, for longevity. We don't know those answers yet. But that data is going to be coming within the next few years. Accountability is important. We all know accountability keeps the patient honest. So it's important to get the data right to the doctor so that I'm, and so we can, when we're talking on the phone because the patient calls up with, with issues of not sleeping, I can actually get an idea of what their sleep cycles are looking like and perhaps their sleep times as well. For, Excuse me, for calorie counting, for making sure that the patient is actually not only eating the, you know, how much you're eating, but what are you eating. We well, you know that in integrated medicine, it's all about the what as much, and not so much necessarily the how much. But so we can actually track the calories, but more importantly, we can track the micronutrients. So we can see the macros and the micros, and to to so we can actually to assist with their clinical therapies. And the awareness of the sleep pattern, as we mentioned. So patients are already on board with lifestyle changes, and they continue to hack their bodies, as we call it, for all this new data. And we, as doctors, need to stay with them in tracking this ability. You need to, there's a whole lecture we can give on apps that patients use that that commonly in the office, and the ones you should be aware of, and the ones that you may want to offer as a prescription. Because most patients would prefer to pay for an application than a medication. That study was out as well. The future of wearables. So, you know, we know about the ability to know where you are. So when you're having a heart attack, we know how to find you. And those are going to be coming in wearables. The old medic alert tags are now being coming implant in your wearable wrist devices. That's why emergency signaling of arrhythmias seizure are about to ready to start. There's a whole lot of interesting things that we can start doing for or asthma attacks so that it, the, the, the wearable device actually starts seeing it coming because we're all like, yeah, I'm, burning, I'm in denial, I'm not having a heart attack, I'm not having an asthma attack, I'm just going to sit down and your wearable device is going to be saying, no, call 911 now. We have the health tracking, which we all know about, um, with the blood sugars are coming out. They have very interesting things with ocular devices for blood sugars and, um, and uh, readable devices uh, that you hold for your blood sugar, which is, has to do with uh, transcapillary uh, illumination, uh, blood pressures that fit around your fingers, uh, their little rings uh, that actually send signals, uh, respiratory rates, those are um, around your chest, and uh, they can also check because of the um, 
blood oxygen saturation on the wrist or finger level, hydration status by skin galvanization, electrolytes, hormone therapy. It's amazing the amount of energy that the U.S. government, the Army, has put in to measuring cortisol in their in their soldiers, which they now have the ability with a sweat a sweat jacket that they wear to measure their cortisol production. And early warning devices I mentioned with electrocardiographs uh, and also EEGs as well for determining the onset of a seizure coming. We studied this as well part of practice and 70% of 77% of our doctors recommend activity tra trainers to their parents, patients right now as part of the treatment plan as well as app, uh, IAPS. And 93% of the physicians stated it would be beneficial to have the Fitbit data integrated into an EMR. And we were approached by Fitbit ourselves and offered that position of being the only EMR which directly integrates with the Fitbit data. And that's amazing because they wanted a wellness and health software. So the Haptitude survey looked, said one out of three doctors are already recommending apps. 73% of patients are healthier because of their apps. 90% of chronic patients would accept a prescription for a mobile app if the insurance paid for it. And 3.4 billion will have access to devices by 2017. This is outside the wearables. This is more talking about the applications of more applications being integrated into the technology so that we as physicians can actually assess this information and, and, and condense it into a readable, objective data. The conclusion, they're here, get used to them. The future of wearables is not wearables, but it's more about analyzing and using that data. So you're going to see wearables become easier, more like jewelry, more like clothes, more like tennis shoes. You're going to see them become invisible, but they're going to become a part of every uh, accessory, jewelry, or clothes that we wear. The people want valuable, actionable insights. This is where we come into play. They know that part of it is coming from the, it's kind of like the laboratories that you give a patient. You can give them the lab data and they're still looking at you saying, what does this mean for me altogether? And that's the same thing that's going to be coming with this, with the amount of data that we're looking at sleep and activity. And we can condense this down into a really easy, identif identifiable and uh, appropriate algorithm that makes it much simpler for us to not only make recommendations, but to confirm and motivate the patient based upon that recommendation of now data that we have on that patient over the last 90 days. And it's all about the data and recombining the data to make sense of it while creating something that's actually useful for us and our patients. Because actionable, the, these devices become extremely useful when the physician or the, when the patient de derives action based upon it. So I appreciate your time and uh, the heads up on these wearable devices. Uh, we will have a blog describing all this information coming out within the next week. Right now we're going to open up the floor to Linda again to take any questions or comments from our audience. Thank you, Dr. Savage. Uh, Ms. Shiro's Kim, uh, Karim, excuse me, has been asking some wonderful questions. So I will begin um, just in order. Is Fitbit offering doctors a better price to include them in the initial visit? And I did copy and paste the Fitbit affiliate link where doctors yeah. and practices can get 12% off. But do you have anything else to add? I, I, I just recommend to any interested uh, participant of this lecture, if they have interest on the Fitbit sales, they should contact our sales office because they constantly change uh, and improve offerings to our to our client base. So the answer is yes, and the answer is they're great, and the answer is they keep getting better, and it's all about uh, it's all about what we can what we can squeeze out of Fitbit. We do that continuously. Okay, wonderful. Is there a Fitbit specific device that you give out or suggest? So I do suggest the Fitbit. I, I like that it's, it's established, it's well known. Um, a majority of people come in with the Fitbit. As, so one out, of, one out of eight of our patients already have a Fitbit. So we don't give them, well, we actually do give one of ours because ours has a little engraving on it that says our office name. So it's a little bit of branding. 
uh, which is great marketing, marketing, right? Uh, but um, we um, one out of eight people come in with Fitbit, but it's also well known by clients. Um, the technology is it's they're very very durable as well as wearable. Some of the other products have had some issues with their wearability. Plus, I'm not I'm really interested in the higher level technology at this point, and I mean higher level data. So I mean the things that are the things that are pretty standard with the heart rate, uh, the sleep. And the um, uh, how many steps per day, all of which is now viewable via the patient. Uh, so when I'm in your chart, I actually say Fitbit, and it shows me all your Fitbit data because you, as a patient, have allowed me access to it. So that becomes a huge tool when I'm working with patients, and I want that data. So I always, we always make sure they set up their Fitbit within our follow-up visit. Uh, we have our office call back and check out people did with their visit. We're making sure that they've actually linked up to the uh, software with their Fitbit. Thank you. Oh, but, I mean, we, we hope to integrate with other mobile devices too, but right now at this point, Fitbit is still the industry leader. And in the chat, I just posted a link to our YouTube video, How to View a Patient's Fitbit Activity, in response to one of the questions that came through. Yeah, it's really simple. <laughs> you're on the patient, you open the patient chart to their landing page and you click Fitbit and then all the data comes up. I mean, it's, it's uh, the, the software itself, if you've not utilized it or seen it, you should call. And it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of equipment. We were just rated by, the, by IFM, the Institute for Functional Medicine, the highest rated EMR among established IFM physicians. So uh, we're really proud of what we've developed here and we're real thrilled to be able to offer to our clients. And the next question, do you get the patient to buy it from Fitbit.com or are they walking out with it after the visit, at the visit? If they're walking out with it, how much are you charging as part of the visit? Again, I, 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 so I, it's included in our first visit. So it's just a gift, but it's included in our visit. So uh, for the patients who don't want it, we don't change our price at all. Uh, and you know we can talk more. I'm, the current price within our office is six hundred dollars for a two-hour visit with with me. So that's my tech, that's my part um, of the of the initial of the initial visit. Okay. So that includes going over the power to practice questionnaire and looking at all of their data. And we already have done a significant amount of laboratory results. We usually order somewhere around 80 different tests on the first visit, and then we get diagnostic tests. And we have a very comprehensive package here, so by the time you're walking out, we have your nutrition set up, we have, you met with a nutritionist, we have your activity fit set up, we have your, uh, we hook you into the meditative people or the stress management people, we've already uh, hooked up the supplements, the hormones, the medication, so that's all encompassing as patients walk in and not walk out. It's pretty overwhelming, actually. And, always looking for ideas on how to make it simple. And one of the ways we make it simple for patients is all of the data is available on their patient portal. So they can go back at any point and review. And we also have people follow up within two days to make sure that they understood it. But that's just my business way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And one more question. I believe you've already answered it, but I will let you reiterate. How much does Fitbit charge for the integrating program and which program do you use in your clinic that works with Fitbit? So the, the EMR software management tool that we use in our practice, which does everything from uh, the EMR to the patient management to the uh, CRM and all of it is power to practice. And power to practice integrates with Fitbit directly. So you don't have, that's not an additional fee. That's just part of the package. Um, for those that have, you know, it's interesting that the recent studies on integrated medicine shows that still most of the doctors who are in integrated medicine doing that as a majority of their practice don't have an EMR. And that's very simple because there's no EMR out there that does what we need it to do, that does supplements and compounds and integrates with specialty labs like Genova and ZRT and SpectraCell and, and works with uh, major labs like LabCorp and Quest and has e-prescribing and compounding that you can hooked straight to your compounding pharmacy and a questionnaire which is modified, modifiable and customizable towards the integrated medicine practice and able to do, I mean, it's just, there's nothing out there like this. And our physicians, we, we have hundreds of physicians on the system and we all ask them, do you want 
medical, do you want the Fitbit device? And 97% said, of course I do. And so we listened and we went out and built more to the system. And so it's worth your time to take a, take a few minutes out of your day, a half hour, and talk to one of our sales representatives and actually view the system to see what an amazing system this actually is. Well, thank you. Does anyone else have questions? Well, wow. right, well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for listening in. And please, if you have any questions, you can contact us through the sales at powertopractice.com. And you can go to powertopractice.com and speak with, get, our, get the office phone number as well. Right. Thank you very much. And good night.